just while I'm talking, just read the quote at the bottom, because it's pertinent to what I'm going to talk about this evening. So, um, yes, thank you, Brian. We've, uh, we've done a, a lot together, and thanks for those kind words. And thank you, everybody, for logging in and, and, and watching this presentation. It's, uh, it's a privilege for me. Um, I was talking with Johan the other day, and I went rambling off about uh, conservation and, and sustainability and, and he suggested well why don't you give a talk so I said oh, he's, I've only got a you know face for print and he said um, and you were lying you and I can see my face on the thing and he said it'll be hidden by the, the presentation anyway he asked me to give a presentation on on conservation and, and sustainability um, the, the ideas, and as Brian said, that the ideas that I will talk about tonight has been, and it's, it's part of my, my, my doctoral thesis, looking at, it, at what we're doing in conservation and, and what's going and where we where are we heading. And, and so this presentation will, will cover that. I'll, I'll start off by giving a bit of a background and a reality check, and then I will look at uh, what we understand uh, around the term conservation and sustainability, because we use them so loosely and we use them um, so generally that they that they that they almost mean nothing. And sometimes, they, as we will see in the in the talk, they can be very conflicting. Um, all right. So the quote is is about is by a colonial game warden who talks about basically that, that what we've been trying to do in Africa has failed. And that, and that is a gloomy picture. Um, but in conservation, we've got to stop at looking at what's in the past. We've got to start looking at what is to come. What kind of world do we want to, to live in? So to start off, I thought I'd give you this slide, and, and I apologize if it's, this is like a lecture. It's not supposed to be, and I'll try and make it as interesting as possible, but the subject material is, is, is just unfortunately of that nature. Uh, the conservation landscape, as I've called it, is the, the conservation process, which is really nicely put out in this slide by Margules and Salafsky that explains the process. There's the socio-ecological, socio-political process here on the left-hand side. Those are the interactions of the various communities, uh, organizations, formal, informal NGOs, researchers, scientists that interact in a, in a complex mix of different ideologies and thinking to address a conservation target. And that's on the far right is your conservation target. On the top of the screen, I've got a quote that says, conservation success is biological, but the process is socio-political. That's very important. In conservation, these days, we tend to confuse the socio-political targets with the, with the conservation targets. I'll get to those now. Basically, and according to uh, Salavsky and Margules, the four basic tools is direct collect, uh, protection. That is really a uh, protected areas, in situ conservation, ex situ conservation, breeding of, um, in ex situ conservation, of breeding of animals to put back into the wild. Um, it does not include captive breeding and um, color variants, and, but I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Then there's the, the policy development. And I always say that philosophy drives policy and policy drives, drives action. So 
a lot of what we do is, is driven by policy and that's what the general psychology or paradigm that, that feeds government. Um, then the other tool, of course, is education and awareness. I actually don't like using those words because conservation is a process and, and, and it is much, much more than awareness. I prefer talking about ca capacity development especially for adults, because when we're talking about our field, we've spent, and I'm not saying we must spend less time with the youth, uh, there, there's specific things we need to do to, to get the youth, youth to understand sustainability and, and, and proper uh, living in the environment sustainably. But um, I strongly believe that we should be focusing more on capacity building and, and helping communities to develop the skills to manage their own resources. And there's a whole skill set that goes with that. And I'll be touching on a little bit that uh, a little bit on that later on. Then changing incentives. These are things like um, we spoke about it, and Tom mentioned it last week, CDNRM or, or ICDPs, Integrated Conservation Development Project, the incentives are put in place to encourage people to, to look after the resources that, that they're in charge of. In South Africa, we've got the stewardship program. In, in Namibia, they've got the conservancies program. And so with a combination of these tools, obviously don't stand separate from each other. They are, they work together with each other um, to address the threats. And, and this is another issue that I think we battle with in conservation is we focus too much on, on the threats, but, and, and not on sustainable systems, but, but that is changing. Um, there are six recognized threats, and those are grouped in, into things like overharvesting, habitat fragmentation, pollution, uh, invasive of species, um, anthropogenic interferences. Population is not one of them. It, it falls under, and I'll clarify that a little bit later. Um, anthropogenic interferences, which is, is, is really the issues we had and, and, and we heard yesterday in climate, climate change issues and all the issues, all the scenarios that, uh, that climate change, how climate change influences our natural habitats and species that live in them. And then, of course, the sixth um, major threat is anthropogenic. Uh, um, it's, it's, uh, extinction synergies. And that really is with climate change, uh, habitats change and species move into new areas. And that is essentially not a problem, but because of development or habitat fragmentation, they can't move and, and therefore they become extinct. And, and there, there are lots of examples of that. And then, our, and then in conservation, our, our targets are biodiversity targets, footprint targets, and socioeconomic targets. And our, and I'll expand on those a little bit later on. So this is just for sustainable, um, this is the, the framework for sustainable livelihoods or sustainable living, whatever you want to call it. I just want you to focus on, if you can see my cursor, on, on this little livelihood assets, which you can see over there is, is human capital, natural capital, Financial capital, social capital, and physical capital. That's what the community has. And, and there are a whole lot of interplays to achieve. And I actually can't see this because the pictures are in a way. How do I get rid of these? How do I hide the pictures? Anyway, there, if, if you can see that on this side, those targets there are those for sustainable communities. And very often those targets clash with the, 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 the conservation targets over here. So while we, and a, a lot of the thinking around sustainability now is talking about this, 
not biodiversity sustainability, but human sustainability. And I just want you to keep that in mind. Um, this is according to Hans Rosling's um, a video pro, uh, uh, YouTube clip, and I, I think the the um, Meredith will put the the clip on onto the chat box of a, a video called "Don't Panic," and he explains the climate. Oh, sorry, not the climate, the population problems. Uh, it's really explains the population issue that we face with. And he talks about the world's PIN code. Um, the PIN code is now 1114, which is 1 billion North America, 1 billion South America, 1 billion Africa, and 4 billion Asia and, and uh, Europe. Um, by the year 2050, we're going to have 1125, which means Asia goes up by, by another billion and Africa goes up by another two. And then in, at the end of the century, Africa will be the only country that will go up to 4 billion. So the world's PIN code is 1145, according to Hans Rosling. And he says the population will automatically um, taper off at between 10 and 11 billion. And that's just the way population dynamics work. So we have to accommodate 10, uh, another 3 billion people in Africa. Now, on, my, on the top, I've got a, a picture of Pilansburg that's full, um, from one of, of, of our Game Rangers Association advisory board, enjoying wildlife. The next picture is a, is a picture of Pilansburg from above. And you can see a whole bunch of development around, around the park there. But Africa still has lots of open space, as opposed to uh, North America, which you can see a picture of, of anybody flown over. Europe will, will see a landscape like the bottom left and cities like the uh, bottom right. There is no reason why. Africa shouldn't develop in, into a landscape that looks like the bottom two slides. That is one of the big uh, criticisms that were given to the, uh, that were um, voiced against the Brontland report was that um, it's all very well to say what we need for sustainable development but it's, it's a bit disingenuous for the West to think, well, they've developed everything. And now the um, developing countries have to be constrained by that. So that was the biggest, biggest um, con the criticism of the, the Brown report that I'll talk a little bit about later on. So what is the, the future of Africa? What does the future of Africa look like? So if we're going to accommodate all these people, the landscape is going to change dramatically. And for conservation planners, we have to keep that in mind. And if you look at a landscape like this, which is, which is a common kind of, of, of land use change in, in lots of Africa, um, what is, where is there going to be place for, for elephants and megafauna? Which, is, which require large areas to roam in. Uh, we, and when we talk, when we show pictures like this, we normally think of um, rural, rural communities. We forget about, let me put the slide in, otherwise there are too many slides. We think too much, we forget about cities that are just part, this, they are also part of the, the ecosystem, usually altered ecosystems, but they also have a biodiversity. They also have a, 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 a function, a, a, well, they can have a deleterious ecological services function, um, but if managed properly, they, they can contribute to, to sustainable lifestyles. 
So we mustn't always think of, of, of a, a transformed rural area. We must also think of, of how we manage our city. So when we talk about wildlife, um, lots of people have different ideas of what wildlife is. Um, when I talk about wildlife in this talk, I'm talking about animals that live in a natural habitat and that can persist by themselves in the wild. That implies a geography, a specific distribution, a specific habitat, an animal or a species with a specific genetics. So when, when I talk about wildlife, I'm not talking about alien species, I'm not talking about, about um, a domesticated species, that's wildlife. The other term that is really misused is biodiversity. And when I was still involved with, uh, with, with the Fly Fishing Association, one of, the, one of the, I think it was the chairman, said to us when we were talking about biodiversity and they were defending um, trout in, in the alien and invasive species list in the South African legislation, they were saying, well, looking at the biodiversity, it is, um, it just seems that it means the more the merrier. And lots of people think when we talk about biodiversity, it's about a number, it's, it's not. It is, it is, and this is this diagram, this circular diagram is from a published a publication by NOS, it's an old publication, NOS, sorry, and uh, was published in 1990 or 1991. And here he tries to explain the, the various components of biodiversity, the structural component, which is landscape patterns, grasslands over woodlands, uh, land, oh, that's, sorry, that's landscape types, landscape patterns, hilly, um, rocky, uh, forested, and so on. And then functional, how, how it functions, um, how it, it, it functions from an ecosystem services. So it's a, a complex collection of things. And if you see it goes in, it all ends up in the middle. And I always say that the common in conservation, the, the lowest common denominator is genetics. And we have to, I really think we have to keep that in mind. On the side here, we've got that little schematic diagram that, that, that shows, that I think that lots of people see is, is biodiversity within species, between species, between populations and communities and ecosystems. So if you take the, the Overall definition of biodiversity means nothing. It only means something when you look at a specific site, like this specific site here. And this from a, this picture is from an advert for a, a fly fishing um, company in South Africa who is advertising the first drift, drift boat. And this is this last week, uh, the first drift boat uh, trout fishing. Um, drift in or operation in South Africa. Um, so what we have here, this is the, the Natal Midlands. We've got the Darkensburg in the background. We have got an array of species. We've got altered landscape in the back there in terms of, of, of um, cloud up fields. We've got cosmos here that's alien. Um, there has got, we've got some black, it looks like some black bottles in the background there that are also alien and highly invasive. And then we've also got in the system here, we have got trout. So does that mean that we have more biodiversity? No, it doesn't. The biodiversity merely is how well is this system functioning in terms of these structure, in, in, in terms of this circle here, in terms of time, the species that are there, the site the disturbances, being the alien invasive, to what extent they're a threat and not, whether you should worry about them or not, whether you should be um, trying to get, eradicate them or not. And um, in this case, well, well, trout certainly has had an impact on the system, but the, the, the country definitely isn't going to exterminate trout. It, it has become a 
and a reasonably lucrative um, outdoor pursuit for for few people and a few companies that benefit that brings employment and so on. So, but the point I'm trying to make is that the biodiversity there would include all the natural things and all I've talked spoke about what is wildlife, um, but it would also include aliens and alien invasives and um, and well those those animals. So I've. I conservation, and, and there are lots of definitions of conservation. And if you look at the term conservation, it is really, a, a, if you look in a dictionary, it, it, it doesn't refer to, to nature specifically. And when we talk about conservation, we, we often confuse the term with environmental conservation, environmental management, and, and whatever. When, in this talk, when I talk, and mostly when we talk, we actually talk about nature conservation. And, and, and the purpose is really to ensure the persistence of species in the wild. According to the World Conservation Strategy, the conservation has three objectives, and these are significant. Conservation of life support systems, those are ecosystem services, the biodiversity and it, uh, of, um, and, and biodiversity, and as I've just explained, now it's more significant and meaningful at site level, and in, in and ensure that the use of resources are sustainable. So, from a conservation point of view, we, we're kind of looking at a model on the on the right hand side of the screen. We have a a, a mosaic of different land uses, protected areas, um, landscape corridors linear corridors like rivers or mountain ridges and stepping stones, patches um, of, of forest or patches of grassland from which animals can, especially birds, can move between those, those specific things. The, the, the issue that I'll be addressing really is what's happening in this gray area, the light gray area, and in the, in the white area because those areas are, are just as important. Uh, this diagram I've adapted from uh, Ron Thompson's first book that he wrote a long time ago, but it ex explains a whole bunch of things very, very simply. People talk about conservation equals preservation, or they say preservation versus conservation, or people say uh, conservation versus um, sustainable utilization. And, and so there are a whole bunch of meanings. And it's really all of them. Um, and if you look at the IUCN definition, it, it shows you, it means all of them. If you had to try and draw a picture of it, and I've tried to do that in, with, with Don's diagram here, if you have a, a population of species of, of any specific population, the more you have in the species, the less you have to manage. And the rarer the species comes to the point of extinction, the more management you have to put into it. So um, there's more management input. That means more personnel, more time, more money, um, more resources. And so you really want to, to get your animals, uh, well, you want your population. Um, and that's what we should be doing, managing for abundance, not for scarcity. Unfortunately, our discipline is focused on, on this, and most of our efforts in conservation focus on rare and, and the crisis narrative, which I'll also try and speak a little bit about later. So if, you're, if, if you see conservation as so, you can... You can if something's common like um, wood or tuna, you can harvest it. But if it becomes rare, like where, where the people worried about whales, you, uh, you, you, you put in conservation of preservation measures. I, I hate the word preservation, but you put in measures to get the population back um, to where they're abundant. Which, which, if anybody's been following whale populations, they are now very abundant. And um, 
we could start utilizing them again. The, the, the point now is we actually don't need them anymore. We don't use whale bones. We don't need oil for lamp and, and so on. So, so it would be um, pointless for us to go back to, to whaling, although some countries still do whale and, and should be allowed to, to whale as part of their, their custom. So we need, to, and then also we need to make a, a, a distinction between conservation and wildlife management. Um, I always say conservation is all of wildlife management, but not all of wildlife management is conservation. So wildlife management, you could be doing intensive breeding of, 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 um, of animals, or you could be doing um, uh, uh, what's the other the other term for the, the color there of breeding for that? That's got nothing to do with 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 conservation. That is more to do with animal husbandry. Uh, breeding of trout is not a conservation. Uh, is a is a wildlife might be regarded as wildlife management, but it's certainly not conservation. Conservation is if you're actually actively involved in trying in in, in managing species for for, for persistence. So I think that distinction must be made. So if you look at the biodiversity and especially megafauna, um, the protected area, and this is just for South Africa, this is a picture taken off the, off the website on the, on the Department of Environment Affairs register for protected areas, and they've got everything on that. Um, um, <clears throat> or the national parks, uh, world heritage sites, uh, provincial nature reserves, and um, biosphere. I've got the biosphere. There's a biosphere reserve. There's a biosphere reserve. So they've got biosphere reserves on there. That's a biosphere reserve. There's one, two. And so we have a mosaic of direct protection, which is those. We've also got breeding facilities and rehabilitation centers. We've also got a collection of ICDPs, uh, integrated conservation development areas, uh, projects, OECMs, which is a new concept, which is relatively new concept that came out in 2018, while the IUCM, which talks about other effective area-based conservation measures that really do not the objective is not a conservation objective, but the outcome is has a conservation outcome. And a good example of that is the South African game launching industry, which in essence isn't really conservation, but it has a conservation spin off. And then, and then environmental management, which is really the area that is in between all the protected areas, all the areas where people just live in their lives and where the economy exists. And, um, and in that, in, in South Africa, at least we've got the Environmental Management Act and then um, the other, the, the Protected Areas Act and the Biodiversity Act, which is our suite of, of conservation legislation, which also links to the Forestry Act and the Water Act and the Agricultural Act and, and so on. So just a quick history of how we've got to where we are now. We have got, and, and, we, we often think conservation has always been around, but the conservation as we practice it now is really started in North America in the mid 1980s with Muir, Pinchot, Grinnell, uh, Roosevelt, who came up with the idea, they got the, forest, the American Forest Service going, they got the National Park Service going, and, and that set the trend for the development of protected areas, which is now, grown and grown and, and almost become the norm. The change really happened in, 19, in the 1960s when, um, when Rachel Carson wrote a book called, it's a novel in fact, about um, this, uh, called The Silent Spring and it's really about how industry pollutes the, the environment. And uh, there, there's also a release in, in seemingly an innocuous movie called um, born free that really made African wildlife popular in, in the West. 
in the developed world. And that changed, basically the 60s was the start of the, the environmental movement. Um, then in 1987, the Bronfman Report was, was published and, and that was the first report that addressed humans' impact on the environment, it came up with the three pillars of sustainability, which is uh, the social sustainability, economic sustainability, and ecological sustainability. And we know lots of business talk about the triple bottom line, that's what they're referring to. Um, recently, they've added the fourth pillar, which is cultural, it must be culturally sustainable. And, um, and, and so that is where, and, and all the NGOs and the, and the private sector got involved in conservation and has led to progressively decentralization of conservation, which was essentially um, in government hands until then. The field that we are of conservation management is conservation biology really got its name in 1985 when Sula published the book Conservation Biology with the something on the scarcity and diversity, the study of scarcity and diversity or something. But anyway, it came out in 1985 and that really gave the field a science to, to which we um, subscribe to and, 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 and more organized in, in terms of, of academia. It also, um, and, and then we, to the present where we now have a landscape approach and we have, um, we, we talk more about sustainability, overall sustainability, we go back to the, 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 the second um, framework, the, the sustainability, we, we focus a lot around that. And then there is, um, but with that, we have developed a crisis narrative, which I, which I don't entirely agree with. And Ivo Fechter wrote a, a, a nice book a few years ago um, as a local author called Extreme Environments, where he highlights how the environmental movement uh, exaggerates the problems and, and do so for their own profit and to make money and to, to get people to give them money so that they can, can do their projects. But just, just this morning, I, I got a, a WhatsApp with, to comment on an article. And the article was a gray literature article or, or just a, by a science writer said, the headline reads, most protected areas do not benefit from wild access study. But in, in the article, there was a link to the actual study. And this was the heading. So I can't, how do I, there we go. Um, the actual heading of, this, of the scientific study that was peer reviewed was protected areas have a mixed impact on water birds, but management helps. And, and there you can see, there's, there's a very different message in, in those two things. And, and this is unfortunately what is driving the, the, the conservation narrative and it's not helpful. So if you look at the evolution of, of, of conservation ideas, we, we've got, we started off with a reductionist approach with, with fortress conservation. And that was, we create national parks, we put fences around them, or sometimes we don't, but we patrol it and we have, and, and we have certainly in Africa, we have ranges there often, often with, with weapons. And, um, and that is, and that is it. It was, it was an island, really. And then we moved over to later in the 80s, when, when people started looking at, at benefits that parks can give uh, to surrounding communities and the, the birth of ICP, ICBPs. And then, then a move towards CDNRMs, where ownership people actually own and manage their own, own resources. And to the current where we are looking at landscape approaches with a, with a variety of different methods in looking at sustainable, uh, resilient systems. 
this is just a, a slide I took during uh, the conference for conservation, uh, the Society for Conservation Biology, and that Tony over there is the chairperson, um, just to show how when we talk about the conservation sciences, and, it, and if you go to the first two diagrams that I showed you, we are really talking about the first picture and the second picture. And, and so in conservation and biology, we have a certain degree of this, you know, stuff that relate to the natural world. Obviously, we've got the social sciences in there, but then the conservation sciences become broader when you look at the greater landscape um, in which people live. And, and that becomes, becomes complex. And I think this diagram shows quite clearly where our issues are, where we, where we have different approaches, attitudes, um, objectives um, in community development and, and upliftment and reaching conservation objectives. And we've been very, Poor at, at mixing the social sciences with the, with the um, natural sciences. This was just a, a, a slide, I, a, a little thing I did for, a, for another talk. I took 18 volumes of the, South Af the Journal for South African Wildlife Managers Association, and I counted all the papers and took out a whole bunch of headings from, from the papers, and then you can see there's still, and this was done two years ago, you can see that most of the papers still deal with species. And this goes completely against what I've just been talking about now. So we, we aren't equipping our wildlife managers to actually work in a real complex um, in, environment. And the work that is being done um, in in, in the social science has been done at the other university and there's, there's very little, little overlap, which is, which is problematic. Okay, so through all, uh, through all this time in the development of conservation, we've got various uh, uh, worldviews or paradigms, starting with, with frontier economics, um, environmental protection, resource management imperative, eco-development and deep ecology. So, and I'll get to the Anthropocene on my, in my next slide. So frontier economics is really about progress, growth, um, prosperity, uh, environmental protection as trade-offs as an ecology versus economic growth, resource management. And I think most African countries subscribe to the, the, the first two and to a certain extent, maybe, sustainability. We all talk about sustainability, but not enough of it is happening out there. And then, of course, green growth. Um, and we can also argue a little bit around that, if you like, about what is green growth. And there's very little for the number of people that we have to deal with that is actually green, including uh, electric motors, solar power, um, all have a, a huge impact on the environment. And then is deep ecology. And if we had to put, uh, which is really about, and, and it's, it's a very nice thought that we could train like and live in harmony with nature, but um, it, it's slightly unrealistic. I'll just expand on that also a little bit later on. Now for the Anthropocene. Everybody's hearing about the Anthropocene and calling this new epoch an Anthropocene, scene, the C-E-N-E -E is the um, end word for, for the epoch. The, the epoch that we actually in is, is the Holocene, as I'm sure you all know. And it is not, the Anthropocene is not a recognized geological epoch. The society, uh, the anthropological working group and the uh, and the subcommission on quaternary stratigraphy is a mixture of, of social scientists and, and natural scientists. They've been pushing the International Commission on Stratigraphy and the International Union of Geological Sciences, who are responsible for designating the geological time zones, 
and he tried to convince them to do that, but they didn't. They sat last year in September and they couldn't come to an agreement. And it, the geological sciences says this is nearly what, what we're going through now is nearly an event and will be represented in a few million times and a few centimeters of rubble. So you'll find some anthropologists digging up an old valiant bumper and wondering where that came from. So when we look at those, the, the previous world paradigms, this is a popular one from the eco, this diagram here, um, we, we see that, you know, a, a human driven environment is, is a disaster. And um, if we, if we ecologically orientated, we've got a lovely um, wild animals and green trees and everything's hunky dory. But that's really not a true diagram. If you had to ask somebody in, in the, that is anthropocentric orientated, you'll just see uh, more houses, more happy people, bigger, fatter millies, uh, lots of fresh drinking water and happy people living in, in societies. So that is the conundrum that, that we sit with in, ter in terms of paradigm. What the, although it's not a, the Anthropocene is not a, an agreed to, it's not an agreed or approved EPA, what it has done, it, it has said that we have a problem and that we need, and we need to do something about it. So if you look at this picture here, you will see that, um, and this was taken off the Anthropocene website, is people, you know, putting technology together so that we can live sustainably. So a lot of the Anthropocene type thinking is to promote sus sustainable societies and communities, but that doesn't necessarily translate to um, translate to biodiversity conservation. So if we had to look at this from a political perspective, on the top, we've got the political spectrum, we've got the right of center, and we've got left of center. And if you look at the, the, the paradigms that I've mentioned before, they can be grouped very loosely into compassionate or sentient conservation. And on the other side, neoliberal neo approaches. So let's see what compassionate conservation is all about. Compassionate conservation really falls within the parameters of the deep ecologists. We, we need to look after wildlife. We don't use animals. Um, animals have no value. Uh, there are lots of articles on, on this, and I, I can't remember the, the gentleman's name who wrote the article that said um, wildlife, art, and music should be useless, valueless, and that we should enjoy it to raise our spirits and to <clears throat> and to um, or just be more spiritual about it, and um, and so wildlife should have no value, and so that's a conservative approach. And if you would, if, what is what would that look like in reality? It would mean protected areas um, because outside of those those protected areas wildlife would not have, have a place and um, and and maybe that would work in in the developed north that have a very different landscape to Africa but certainly in Africa it, it's probably not practical because we don't have this, the space uh, we don't have the money to look after it. Our protected areas are under threat anyway. Many of them are just paper parks, and most of them are underfunded. In fact, in South Africa, only three national parks make any money whatsoever. And then there's the will. I don't think there's a will, especially in Africa, to follow a compassionate conservation approach. So, what is uh, so where does this fit onto the 
on, on the political spectrum. If you go back to deep ecology, that kind of left, but left of center. But if you look at this conservative approach, this actually falls right of center, which is interesting. Neoliberal, in, in, and in many articles, people talk about about the win-win situation and how this win-win situation doesn't work in a, a, a CBNL CB, because this is really community-based integrated development projects and um, where people are given ownership uh, of, of the resource and management of the resource. Again, it's that decentralization of, of, of ownership governance and resources, and um, which is surely not a bad thing. And neoliberal is left, so it should be there. So this, this trend that we followed towards progressive approaches are kind of reversed when we look at the political spectrum. In this, this scenario, neoliberal approaches, you need expertise in collaboration and, and landscape management, and it's also not easy. Um, so when we, when we talk about, and, I, and I'm using these two species as, a, as an example of how, how fickle we are when it comes to looking after our natural resources. A little, this is the mist toad. It only occurred in a mist forest in, a, in, a, in one waterfall in Tanzania and uh, where they decided to build a hydroelectric power, uh, power scheme. And uh, that drained the water away from the waterfall and the mist disappeared. And the frog started disappearing. So a bunch of researchers started to create a, a, an environment for it. Couldn't, took a whole bunch back to North America where they successfully, fortunately, bred them in a, in a laboratory. And so there's a, quite a significant population of the mist toad in the, in, in the laboratory. Apparently, they have tried to reintroduce them and created a, a habitat for them, but I'm not sure whether that has happened or, or if it has happened, whether it's been successful. This other little fish is, is the devil's hole tough fish that occurs in the Mojave Desert in, in Nevada. And it only occurs in a few small warm pools um, that and, and there's a, a limited number of them. It was the first fish, I think, that was protected by the Endangered Species, the Endangered Species Act, the, the main um, protection act in, in North America. And um, when it was given protection, the, the local landowners were said, listen, it's a desert. So the landowners needed the water and they needed to pump it out into, into, into their fields and their crops and so on. And they were told not to, this is a protected species. And people started saying, well, um, what, of, what use is this little fish to us? Or what does it matter if it disappears or not? And so this is the, 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 the decision that, that, that we have to make um, in society. And very often it's, it's a emotive decision. In both cases, in, in in the tough fish, they, they found other populations, fortunately, and the landowners did, in fact, cut down on their pumping. So, so the fish, thankfully, is still around. But the, the point is that lots of people, in both cases, the decision was made to go ahead with the development at the expense of the, the species. So, so there's a risk when looking at and uh, uh, when just looking at protection, you're going to sit with these with these very difficult um, questions to answer. But if you look at at a, a more landscape approach, 
And I'm just using the Rhino Conservation as, as, a, as an example here in the Kruger National Park. We've got, um, we've got the Kruger National Park, which is obviously a, a big area, but there are moves to extend it into Conner Zoo, and in, in fact, include this whole area into a greater conservation area. And if you take the two million odd people that live on this side of the, the Kruger National Park are directly, and I suppose you can say the same for the people in Mozambique, the people on, on this side are, <clears throat> are directly, indirectly, legally or illegally benefiting from the Kruger National Park. And, but it, it, because it is part of a greater region. Where in the past, if you take it, and that's the difference between, between the fortress approach and, and the new, more popular approach, is to look at the parks as, as, as part of a greater system. So if you look at the protection of the rhino, you've got, you've got a, a whole variety of different strategies that you need to, to address if you want to save the rhino. You can't just protect them and try and keep them safe in the Kruger National Park, but that's not going to happen if the markets still require the horn and if the people on the side are still comply. So you need some kind of, of social development program here to get people to appreciate that there's a, there's a, there's a rhino there and it actually contributes to their livelihood. We don't, we don't talk about that. And the same thing happens on, on this side. So there we have the, the, the two examples of the, the pupfish and, the, and the, the toad as species specific interventions as, a, as opposed to a land, landscape type intervention. Now, if we go back to uh, the philosophies that, that drive conservation in the world at the moment, most of them, are Western centered and the West, the West is regarded as those in the dark blue, that includes Australia, drifting off in the Pacific there, South Pacific. Um, but, and, and these communities, these societies here, strongly follow a compassionate or sentient conservation um, approach and imposing that on, on Africa. And I am not convinced that that is the appropriate approach. If you take a, a line through the developing countries from, from South America to Africa into Asia, you'll find that people have a very different opinion. And while you might think that the governments are signatories to the IUCN and Ramsar and, and COP uh, and the CDD and, and, and so on, um, the people on the ground, actually are not interested, don't understand, and on a di completely different, um, they're just struggling to survive. But I am part of a, a WhatsApp group of ex uh, South African Wildlife College students. And on the shooting of Cecil the Lion, this is what one of the guys said, I can't believe all this fuss over a lion. That is when the phone's ringing off the hook in what wild crew, I think it was, um, off the hook by people up in arms because of this line. The people on the ground, and these are conservation people on the ground. Then just last week on the, on the same WhatsApp group, a lady, apparently some guy killed a line with his bare hands in Uganda. And he said, can you, and she said, imagine such an angry person it means he's really tired of Uganda and all the creatures in it. And so you have a very different understanding of uh, people on the ground, have a very different understanding of, of um, wildlife and it's, it's important and its importance. So have conflicting ideologies in Africa. Af East Africa, West Africa has followed its own route. 
in, in, in conservation, but their wildlife systems are, their wildlife populations are declining. And the same thing for, for East Africa. These have followed a sentient approach, strongly influenced by, by the West, that in Southern Africa, all the SADC countries, but including Tanzania, has followed a similar route to here where we have given the commodity a value. And, and that is the, the difference. In South Africa, just about all of our countries see growing populations of, of wildlife. Um, in Kenya, there is, has been a 70% decrease in wildlife over the last 40 years. There are a number of reasons for that, but I, I do believe it is because the people, because this is really, these are areas outside of protected areas where most of the wildlife occur. And if people don't see value in, in that resource, they are, they are certainly not gonna care for it. This is um, the, and this is courtesy of Elephants Without Borders. They have got all the hunting concessions. And, and thankfully, I suppose you um, are <laughs> concluding the talk. Um, so I'm moving now towards um, future, future scenarios and, and landscape, the landscape approaches. The green areas are protected areas, the red areas are wildlife management areas, this is where, where hunting is allowed. Now this, there's no conservation management, this is where people live with wildlife. If there is no specific incentive for these people in these areas to look after wildlife, they will not. And in this case, elephants. Elephants occur, well, this is down on as the Tuli block, all the way up here, this is all. Okay, from the previous slide, I just wanted to mention, I don't know whether you heard me talk about uh, Craig Packer, who wrote a, that spoke two weeks ago, who wrote the book on, on lions. But in the book, he says in, in the hunting concessions in, in Tanzania, those that were closed um, by, by the, the anti-hunting unit of, of organizations weren't able to put something else in its place. And, and so a big challenge for us is to, to find ways of generating funds other than for hunting and, and tourism uh, for uh, conservation areas in Africa. And to end off on, on, a, on, a, on a positive note, there are lots of initiatives. And last week we heard of the, the Liwa project and, and very encouraging in, in South Africa. We've got the, the Kruger to Canyons and Biosphere Reserve and those great expansion. And this is a, 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 I'm sure lots of you have heard of the CASA project, which is a, the project that extends in the project area is this area in white. Those are the protected areas and strategies like IC, CDNRMs and community conservation areas, wildlife management areas are all in these areas here. And we have to find ways of doing that. But this is happening. This is a huge area that goes into Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Namibia. And I just want to thank Africa Geographic for allowing me to use one of their, their pictures. So it's, it's very too easy to be gloomy, but there is a lot happening and there are lots of these projects happening throughout Africa and they're growing. Um, I want to end off with this slide. This slide is from the, the um, journal called Current Conservation. Um, and I think Maris will put the, the link on for you. It's, it's a fantastic um, journal that is actually based in, in Bangladesh, I think. And it's got a lot of new articles with new thinking about what's happening, happening all around, around the world. This is, I think the latest one is, is this diagram of, of mixed landscapes 
And I, I think that's what, what we're looking at in Africa. And we have to look at ways of, of realizing this kind of, of footprint. But it is not going to be the IFORS, the Born Free Foundation, IUCN. It's not going to be WWF, Conservation International, any of the big bingos, big international NGOs. It's going to be the people on the ground that save Africa's wildlife. And with that, I'd like to uh, end off my talk. Sorry, I took a bit long. Lovely. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and thank you, Peter, for that incredible talk. Uh, Rod, you can help Yuan as well, please. If you see any questions, um, then just uh, alert me to that. Um, so uh, please use the reaction tools that uh, Zoom so kindly provided us with um, and put up your hand or just wave at us, jump up and down, and we will uh, give you a minute to our minute or two to ask your questions, uh, please. And thank you. Just checking. Yes, thank Ruan, I think uh, Peter has given us a lot to think about. That talk was, was too full, Peter. You should have. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a lot to think about there. But um, I agree with you on so many points about the big NGOs. I think we need a private conversation sometime. Here's a question from, uh, thank you, Rod. Here's a question from Desiree uh, from the chat section. Thank you, Peter. Uh, you've been fantastic. One question, how will Recon Africa oil exploration in the Kavango region affect the KAZA and the Okavango Delta? Yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah, what, I, what, I can, what I can say is that... Um, is that I know at the IUCN conference in Marseille that there was a motion passed to actually intervene there. I don't know how that's going to happen. And I think it's those of us that are on the, on the South African or Southern African committee, because it, you know, we can't interfere and the, the South African component of IUCN cannot interfere with, with, uh, with what happens in Botswana or in, in, in Namibia. But certainly, um, I'd be I'd be upset if it happened uh, because it it would definitely uh, detract from the, the the kind of landscape that I would like to see there. Mm -hmm. But then, and as I mentioned in my talk, you know that the, the, the countries want development and they want to grow and they want to create jobs and, and wealth for their people. Whether that money goes to the right place is, is another story. And that's probably something that I, that I should have mentioned in the, within our conservation environment. Where does the money go? And a lot of the money that's being generated through tourism and, and through hunting and, and through various other issues are not being channeled through to, to um, back to conservation. And that's a, and that's a big problem. But mm -hmm. that, that didn't answer your, your question. With regard to, so, so it's going to be, it, it's really going to mean a, a, a lot of lobbying, but intelligent lobbying to get the, that project stopped. And um, as it will be, I think, quite difficult to get the, the um, seismic um, sensing stopped off the, both the west and the east coast of, of South Africa. I was actually speaking to a, a lady that worked on the, when they were working on the, when Shell were looking at fracking in Peru, she was worked on the community participation uh, shell committee. And she just said to me that, and I spoke to her two weeks ago, she said to me that she will not put a drop of uh, shell petrol in her car 
the way that they went about behind the scenes manipulating and um, going against these things. So I would, just for that reason, just because the, 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 it isn't a genuine desire to uplift people, it's just greed. And on, on those grounds, I would, I would strongly support all the people that are going against the, the, um, the mining in the, in the delta and the seismic sensing in the oceans. I know that didn't answer your question, but it, it, it's, it's a difficult one. I agree. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for the question. Patricia, your hands up. Um, I'm going to ask you to unmute, please. Yes, there thank we. you so much, Ruan. Um, hi, Peter. My name is Patricia. I'm a XTUT alum. And um, I'm actually in the finance sector at the moment. I'm doing environmental and social governance. So this talk was particularly interesting to me. Um, and I wanted to ask you, looking at all the different kinds of conservation that you've identified, the different dogmas and attitudes towards conservation, has there been one that has been more successful than another? Or has it been that one has been more successful at preserving one particular type of biodiversity conservation? So for example, has the type of conservation we do seem to have been more successful because we're focusing on species? Or is there one that's actually just more successful than the other? No, that's actually a, an excellent question. Um, I, there, there isn't, and, and everybody who, who, who's spoken on this, on this show, on this platform, has always said there's no silver bullet, and there isn't a silver bullet. We, and um, I always talk about, um, and Brian will bear me out on this, we always talk about composite conservation, in that every situation has a different context to it and has a different uh, dynamic to it, political dynamic, economic dynamic. And, um, and so what works in one area will not work in, a, in another area. A slide I missed out because I just wanted to get uh, you know, I didn't want to drag it on too long, was, you know, what do we need? Um, and, and that was one of the points. We, we, need, a, a, we need to be um, we must be accommodating to different approaches, different ideologies, um, because what we're, what, you know, uh, we can't exclude one ideology over another because it, it might work in, a, in another context. So I think there are different methods, of, the different approaches and different strategies that, that can be applied at, at um, in different contexts. And that depends largely on, yeah, on, the, on the context. What I will say though, is that um, what, as soon as, as, as much as it is nice to think that, that wildlife has a value, I think an important component is that a, a resource, let's not talk about wildlife, let's talk about the resource. If resources have a value mm -hmm. and that people can benefit from it, I think that's a, that's a common strand. Another common strand is no project works without government support. And when I say government support, I mean a government that acts responsibly and has good policies in place and, and, and acts in the interest of its people. Uh, that's a tall ask, but, but um, if you look at all the successful projects, there's, there's, there's um, legislative and, and through legislative, there's, there's government backing. And you can, you can look at, at the Namibian context where they've got the, the conservancies program that's legislated. So if you, if you look at the area that is outside of protected areas, but is now included in a conservation estate, it is where communities have been given ownership and responsibility for their resource. Hmm. Hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you so much, Peter. I'd love to also connect with you privately if that's if that's possible. <laughs> You're most welcome. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you, Patricia. And um, we'll make sure that we link with, uh, well, we link both you and uh, Peter with one another. Any other questions from the audience? Live questions, I'm scrolling through. No one's jumping up and down at me at the moment. Ruan, can we stir the pot a bit and ask Andy to perhaps ask his question live? Yes, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do it. Andy? Can I put you on the spot? Andy looks a bit frozen there, though. <laughs> Deep in thought. <laughs> like a dance <laughs> sculpture. But uh... <laughs> maybe, maybe it froze just at the right time. <laughs> right, put the question out there, please, uh, Johan. Okay, so um, Peter, Andy's question is, I think I might have to disagree with the notion of being able to justify whaling under any circumstances. And that was just a little sideways comment that you threw in there. Um, regardless of current population size, would we do the same with elephants? Question mark. Well, it is a resource and it's not for me to decide, it's for the people on the ground to decide whether they want the elephants there or not. And um, if they have, if they're getting value out of the elephant, whichever value that might be, um, and it is sustainable, then it is their choice. And I think that that is what's happening in Botswana, whether you like it or not. Whether, whether you like elephant hunting or not. I don't particularly like elephant hunting, but it, it, uh, it's a... Um, but <clears throat> it's a sustainable resource. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I didn't say that whaling is... Uh, I said some countries still whale, I don't think we. I don't think we will whale because it's not necessary to whale for their products anymore. But some countries do, and I think they should be allowed to do that, depending on the population size. Yeah. If I can just jump in here, um, Johan, and I don't want to talk on behalf of anybody else, but the uh, recent uh, this person that we collectively met. Um, sort of said that the problem with sustainability is that we always drive sustainability to the edge of the tipping point. Um, it is not in terms of um, how little can we use, it is how much we can use. And that brings you to the edge of the tipping point. And um, it needs a few numbers to this or that side to swing it. And uh, so from a sustainability side, uh, I always worry about uh, the, the, the usage, um, which will, once it's allowed, that minute you take it to the edge where it can easily just swing over. And that's for me one of the concerns around starting the, whether you're talking elephants, whales, or whatever you're talking about. Um, but it was an interesting perspective for me that it's always about how much and not how little. And that's a bit of a concern. Just another point to throw into the pot. Yeah, then, well, then it's not sustainable. You know, and, and that's what people misunderstand about the concept is that it is, we, we utilize just about everything in our, in our society, we depend on natural resources. And we, we should be using those sustainably. If it's not sustainable, then we shouldn't use it. Uh, what people, when we talk about sustainable and sustainable use, people think, well, you either utilize it or, or, um, or you don't. And um, you're either against it or you, you're for it. But if you, if the resource isn't sustainably, can be sustainably, you don't, then you don't, you don't have to use it. Um, the problem that we do sit with is that people need resources and we have a, a lot of mouths to feed and a lot of people 
to cater for. And that makes a lot of what we do not sustainable. But that doesn't mean mm. to say that we should not subscribe to a principle of sus sustainable sustainability mm. or sustainable use. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you, Johan, for pointing out um, uh, uh, Andy's question, although Andy disappeared uh, from sight. Any other questions, Johan? Did I miss one? There's a few. There's lots of comments in the chat section that we will um, send along to Peter for his perusal a bit later. Um, um, but not yeah, not now. Not now. <laughs> Ron, I totally agree with Peter. He, he goes through the trouble of preparing, doing this talk, and then he's got to answer to 20 questions. <laughs> but uh, yes, of course, we leave it to you to decide uh, what and where you want to respond, Peter. I'm, I'm going to enjoy a sustainable whiskey now, unsustainable whiskey, <laughs> because um, if, you, if you travel through the, the UK, you'll see kilometers and kilometers of wheat it's destroyed natural habitat just to produce whiskey that I can enjoy. <laughs> All right. Ron, it seems to me that uh, uh, more of us might be enjoying an unsustainable whiskey now. That's true. Um, yeah. Well, there's Looks one like Llewellyn. One end race. Uh, uh, yeah. Llewellyn, please. And we make that the last question. Thank you. Or comment. Uh, uh, yeah, hi, 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 everyone again. Yeah, it's really just a couple of comments. Um, you know, I just find it incredible how how little governments really take it seriously when they start looking at impacting negatively on world heritage sites. Uh, you know, the Okavango Delta is a world heritage site which was uh, proclaimed in two thousand and fourteen. And it was a special one because it was the, it was the thousandth one. Um, I mean, that's one example. And in, in South Africa, you know, the, the Barberton Mountains, the, the Maponya uh, Mountains in Barberton and the, the World Heritage Site there and, and the, the hassles that the um, uh, Regional Conservation Authority ever had, um, just the way they've tried to deal with this, it's, it's also just incredulous. And then today, I don't know if anyone was on the webinar today, but the Daily Maverick had a webinar today entitled The Crossroads, State Capture and Ecosystem Collapse. And I don't know if anyone was on it, but there were things that came up in that webinar today that I was absolutely shocked about, that I had no idea about um, in terms of state capture, and eco ecosystem a pretty good webinar too and and I, I i came out of that webinar just after lunchtime today feeling pretty grim about things you anyway, know just a couple of comments they're not i'm sorry they're not really directly related to the talk no thank you can i can i comment you on yes please Peter. Um, Llewellyn, yeah you know you know that is such a good point the, the governments don't take any of Never mind World Heritage Sites, seriously. They don't, they don't take and anything with seriously. We've got members of the Game Rangers Association across Africa who, who fill in monthly, uh, quarterly reports. And in those reports, all of them say they get very little government support. And, and the support is direct and, of course, financial support, material support. So it's, so it's, a, it's a common thing. You know, it's not just South Africa, it's, it's all over, over the continent. But and the way around that is that we, we have to integrate our wildlife resource into the local economies, whether we like it or not. We're going to have to do that. And, and that's why we have to look at larger landscapes and 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 a, and a mix of things. Going back to the, the, my final uh, illustration, um, that, that we have to go that route. Otherwise, we are just, that then they will not take us seriously. Our old way of looking at, 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 at our protected areas and our, and our wildlife resource in Africa uh, needs a, a revamp. And we are not allowed to do that because of external pressures. 
we haven't, Africa has not developed its own conservation ethic. And uh, we need it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the thanks for the comment. Thank you. Wonderful. Mark Lottick has his hand raised. If if um... oh, Mark is there, I didn't yeah. notice. Hello, Mark. Please come in. <clears throat> Hello, Chris and everybody. Um, Mark. On a previous webinar, I made a comment that uh, I felt that a lot of what is being discussed doesn't not necessarily need an economics conversation or a biological uh, conservation conversation, but it actually needs an overriding philosophical conversation. And Peter touched on this by explaining how different regions of the world have very different attitudes of what's happening. And I'm sure that if one breaks it down even further, one will find that these attitudes actually differ not just by continent, but probably even within the regions. And again, Peter made the point about the different areas of Africa having di very different attitudes and approaches. And all of these are rooted in a fundamental, I think, moral conversation about what one expects to happen. And um, even the picture of, at the very beginning of the talk where Peter suggested that the future, or maybe it was actually a different talk, which I looked at earlier. But anyway, that the, the world could end up looking like Europe, because somehow a lot of what is going on is very Eurocentric. And I think more than anything, it is a fundamental philosophical attitude about the relationship we have uh, between humanity and the animal world. And just a last comment, or maybe just a suggestion, is that what I feel is happening is that irrespective of where one looks, um, certain groups in countries adopt Eurocentric perspectives of the relationship between humanity and the environment. So there is maybe actually hope in the sense that one can have a universal conversation because the power elites seem to be all talking the same language even if the people on the ground don't. So that's just a little comment from me who's uh, you know, sitting somewhere in Germany at the moment and far away from Africa. But um, in a way that's at least, you know, I think is something I would add to the conversation. Thanks Mark. And I just wanna come in here and say you might be far away from Africa at present, but you are Africa by heart and by uh, visiting. So it's not like you are not in the context of Africa in terms of your thinking. Thanks um, for that contribution. Can I just say something to Mark? Mark, have you yes. heard of Emma Maris? She wrote The Rambunctious Garden and she's just written Wild Souls. I haven't, but I have um, recently read Amitav Ghosh, The Nutmeg's Curse which uh, I think in many respects um, says, or actually, let's say, I nearly quoted him. It's a worthwhile read, I think. Um, it is very, very depressing, if you think about it, because it basically says that the boundary of everything is just extermination. No more, no less. And that yeah, even the yeah. purpose of many activities is fundamentally the elimination of other species to make space for, a spe for an improvement of the land. Improvement, obviously, in quotes. Mm -hmm. But I, if, you, if you put the name of the author, in, in, that would be really helpful, in the chat, please. Share with us, Peter, what you want to say about Emma Harris. Emma, Ma um, Emma Maris. Um, and she wrote The Rambunctious Garden and Wild Souls. And the, the, the latest book, Wild Souls, is, a, a, is about humans' relations with, with wildlife and, and animals. And um, look, at, it's, it's worth a read. I, I, I doubt whether we'll ever get a universal view. And, um, and I, I did mention in my talk that a, a lot of the, you spoke about the 
the, the power elite that, that, that holds the, the conversation that isn't being held on the ground, I, I'm, that is an issue that, that needs to be addressed. But it should be addressed uh, without prejudice and um, not pushing one view over another as being a better view of looking at things. People just have different views and, and, and we'll never agree to, to one view, unfortunately. So we must work with, we, we must work within that assumption. All okay. right. Um, Yvonne uh, and uh, Ron, just check if there's any other questions. I think that. I think that is it. Yeah. Please, uh, need more yeah, whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get the whiskey now, Peter. Uh, <laughs> you know, at the end, at the end, you have to make a decision, mm -hmm. uh, and a con and, and, and in a in a certain context in a certain given situation. And then you have to decide what you would like the future to look like, thanks to Mark Lottich, um, and, um, and, and work towards that. But for sure, there's a bigger uh, picture than just our one-sided picture sometimes. Uh, Peter, I will most definitely watch your talk again to follow everything that you've said. It was really very comprehensive and also to the students, uh, listen to it again. And then uh, at some point you have to drop the anchor and say, this is how I'm going to do it or how I believe the future should look like and at least try and move forward. Um, but it's not simplistic. That's the big thing. It's not just a simple, this side or that side or one, one size fits all. So Peter, thanks for your preparation and your presentation.